Tonight we get to um, uh, a new journey in the book of Ezekiel, and it's going to be fun. It's going to be uh, uh, painful. <laughs> it's going to be difficult sometimes, and it's going to be uh, one of those things, particularly this book, the book of Ezekiel. The reason why I wanted to do Ezekiel, and it is, uh, I think it is the Lord's uh, appointing to us to do Ezekiel, because right after Romans, we're going to do Hebrews. And you're going to see how reading Ezekiel and going through Ezekiel, you're going to have such a clear understanding of Hebrews. You know, they, they kind of like go together. And uh, being that Ezekiel was a priest, what we're going to see a lot, if we want to know about the temple and the priest and the sacrifice, Ezekiel is the man. Ezekiel is the person. So, again, we get to, <clears throat> we get to start um, this journey, and we pray that uh, more will join with us on Wednesday night. And uh, we'll see, hopefully, hopefully at the end of the, you know, I don't know, 10 years that we're going to spend in Ezekiel, we're all going to be here rejoicing. And hopefully we don't get to finish the book, but we get to see the actual uh, reality of Ezekiel up in heaven. Amen? Yeah, amen. Uh, I just want to give you a quick report. I was um, talking to uh, Tony just before I walked in here. And I just wanted to say how, how you're doing and all of that. And the guy, you know how he is. Instead of me praying for him, he says, Pastor Bert, you got to go teach. So hurry up. Let me pray for you. So he started praying for me. But he's, he's doing uh, better. He's at home. He went through a lot. And, and I said, don't, sh don't, don't share anything with me right now because I want you to share with the church once, you, once you're able to get back in here. So continue to pray for him. Uh, uh, he had quite an experience, but God is good, and uh, they both, him and Emma, they said, you know, now we trust the Lord even deeper because he is good, and, and we have seen his goodness. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you, and uh, Lord, here we are at the beginning of a new journey in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, <laughs> Father, you, you definitely prepare us for such a time as this, and you want us to go through this book because you have uh, so many things you want us to uh, gather and to learn, and so many principles that you want us to apply to everyday life from the book of Ezekiel. Lord, I pray that you will give us wisdom and understanding, and that you will definitely guide us through your word as we take on this journey, and as we continue to just study your word, because we want to be ready. We want to walk in those uh, good works that you prepare beforehand for us. And so, Lord, it's all about you. Uh, we pray that you will be our teacher, that you will be the one speaking to us. Uh, as we gather here together, uh, the most important teaching, I pray that it will happen at home in our quiet time as we go before you in our little corner there and that you can reaffirm uh, the things that we are going to be reading here. And then every time we gather together that we can rejoice knowing that such a beautiful book and yet it is so personal because my God, my Savior, our Holy Spirit teaches us daily the truth in this book. So it's all about you and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to give you uh, tonight the background, the historical background to Ezekiel, very important uh, book uh, for, for sure there is this... Uh, doctrine about the millennial kingdom and uh, a lot of people attack you know the millennial kingdom they said there's only one chapter in the bible that talks about the millennial kingdom and that's in the book of revelation that's because they never read ezekiel because when we get to ezekiel you're going to see that beginning in verse 33 all the way to the end is all about the conditions that are going to be in the millennial and then we're going to end up with with uh, the new temple and, and all of those things, but uh, it's going to be amazing. <clears throat> but it, it, is a, it is a complicated book, I have to admit. It is complicated because we make it complicated. There are some things that God wants to communicate to us, and he just puts things in a simple way. They said that um, some of the things here, <laughs> they said that there are two people that try to um, figure out some of the content in the book of Ezekiel. It says those that are always looking for something to be critical about, and then the others that have the spirit of a little child, that you read what is here and you say, thank you, Lord. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. But I know what is the message, the context. I know what is the point of the book of Ezekiel. And the book of Ezekiel is about God in his faithfulness, in his grace, patiently bringing his people to a personal relationship with them so that after all the things that they have done, 
the people of Israel. He is waiting for them to turn to him so he can give them a new spirit and a new heart. That's the content in the book of Ezekiel. It's all about God and his grace and calling his people and saying, listen, have you, have you already had uh, enough of your suffering? Have you experienced a lot, uh, enough of your pain? Are you going to continue in that direction? Or are you going to turn to me and I'm here ready to give you a new spirit, a new heart? And we're going to see that. It's, that's a simple message in the book of Ezekiel. Yes, a lot of issues and a lot of things that are difficult for us to explain. But before we get into the actual book, let me give you this, the historical background. And if you open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 11... Now, I'm going to be reading some of these uh, chapters here in 1 Kings and then 2 Kings because I want you to understand when we get to Ezekiel, why is it that the conditions uh, during the time of Ezekiel, why? How is it that they got there? Why, uh, what was the Lord doing in allowing some of those things? So 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. And again, I'm going to be reading um, several passages here, so please um, bear with me. And it says here in chapter 11, verse 1, 1 Kings, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, Edomites, the Sidonians, the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord has said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to this in love. And he has 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, an abomination of Moab, and the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Amnon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon. That's one of the most uh, painful and scary verses in the whole Bible. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. And had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep, the, keep what, the, what the Lord had commanded him. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my, my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Hmm. Not a, not a good thing, huh? Second Kings chapter 17, please, if you don't mind. Now, that I just read to you, First Kings chapter 11, that the year for that, if you want to actually, I forgot to tell you that, if you want to put a date on that right above chapter 11, put 931 BC, 931. Now, Second Kings chapter 17, on top of chapter 17, you can put 722 BC and then under that, write, the northern kingdom defeated by Assyria. So this is the context. Solomon, he went after these other, well, not that he went after these gods, but he allowed these women to, to just basically worship these gods. And because of that, that you're going to have what is called the divided kingdom. Now you remember, in Israel, we had how many original tribes? Twelve. After this division of the kingdom here, what you're going to have is you're going to have 10 tribes on the north and two on the south. Who remembers the two tribes on the south? Judah and Benjamin, yes. And so <clears throat> this here, 722, so here you have the northern kingdom, and they are going to be in Samaria, and they're going to be the northern kingdom. They, they had all these kings, and they were from bad. To worse. They, 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 they were really bad. The southern kingdom had so many good kings, but I'm going to give you some of that information. But here comes the problem. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom is going to be defeated. Chapter 17, Second Kings. In the 12th year of Ahaz, king of Judah, 
You see that? You there? Verse 1. Hosea, the son of Elah, became, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. And then Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Hosea became his vassal and paid him tribute money. And the king of Assyria un uncovered a conspiracy by Hosea, for he had sent messengers to so king of Egypt and brought no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done by year, year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Now the king of Assyria went through all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Halah and by the Habor, the river Gosan, and in the cities of the Medes. So here is the king of Assyria who by this point has so much control, so much dominion over the northern kingdom, the ten tribes there, and, he, and they are paying taxes, if you will, to, to the king of Assyria. When they said, we're not going to do this, they, they rebelled against the, against the king of Assyria, and then they said, oh, so, so you're not going to be fighting against us? So they come, and they destroy, and they take all the ten tribes, and basically some people said, and they disappear. They didn't disappear. Just because we don't know them means that they disappear and forever cease to exist. God knows where they are and who they are. And he'll, he'll, he'll bring them back together whenever it is his time. So the reason I want to give you that is because these are important dates. 722 B.C., the northern kingdom defeated by Assyria. Second Kings now, chapter 22. <clears throat> Again, I just want to give you these things because th these are some amazing dates that we need to keep in, 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 in place. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 30 years in Jerusalem. Now, is this the north or the south? Where is it? The south. The south. Okay, good. You see, you're amazing. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Jedida, the daughter of Adiah of Boscat. Man. If you're going to remember those, 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 those names, I'll buy you coffee the rest of the year. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. And he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Hosea, here's in verse 3 all the way to verse 10, what is going to happen is that something's going to happen in the temple. Here are some people that are going to bring some money to the temple. And as they are going through some of the things in the temple, here, here is going to happen something amazing. Josiah is going to come, and they're going to find the book of the law that for many years have been missing. Now, you can just imagine. Here's the people of God without the word of God. <laughs> and, and so finally, after these many years, they find the book. Josiah is excited, and everything is excited. And there's going to be a little revival there. The reason I want to give you this is because Josiah is key in understanding the book of Ezekiel. Verse 11 now, just so you know. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hekiah the priest, and he's going to give instructions to some of these people. And he's going to say in verse 13, go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Now, as he continues to do these things, this is what's going to happen. He's excited. There's a little revival going on. He says, we have, the, we have the word of God. We have to get back, and maybe God is going to be gracious, and he'll forgive us. And the Lord says, Josiah, that's not going to happen. I have already set up that judgment is coming upon Judah. Now, remember, the northern kingdom, they're done. Now, the remaining two tribes in the south, they are the only ones that are in the land. And the Lord says, Josiah, your people, they're gone so far. Now, but Josiah, this is what I'm going to do. All the while that you're here, for the rest of your life, I'm not going to bring judgment. But right after you die, judgment is coming on these people. And the reason he says that is because, because he says, basically the Lord says, Josiah, I know your heart. And just the, 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 the joy of your heart when you found the book and all of this and the, the revival and how you want to get the people back in that relationship, the Lord says, I'm going to wait until you die. And then right after you die, I'm bringing judgment on the people of Israel. Hmm. 
chapter 23, now verse 29. So there is a little revival here. Things are going okay for Josiah and the southern kingdom for a little bit. But there, then there's this event that we don't really know what happened and why Josiah is doing this. Chapter 23, verse 29. Now, the date for that is 609 B.C. Chapter 23, verse 29. You can write on the side, 609 B.C. And this is what happens. It says, in his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him. And Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo when he confronted him. Don't know what's going on, but this is what, what, what happens. Pharaoh Necho is going up north, and somehow Josiah, uh, many scholars believe that, that the Ark of the Covenant, he wants to make sure that he, that he recuperates that. That's just an assumption. We don't, we don't really have evidence to say that that's the case. But somehow, Pharaoh Necho is going up to battle, uh, and here comes Josiah, and he, he is going to engage in battle with Necho, and Necho kills Josiah 609. And the reason I'm telling you is because remember what the Lord says? When you die, judgment is going to come over the southern kingdom. So now, what you're going to do is, you're going to turn to chapter 24, verse 1. And right on top of that, you're going to write 605 B.C. And then under, under that, you're going to write first deportation. And I'll tell you that in a, min, in a minute. Okay, let me just give you the verses, and then we, we, we expand a little bit on these things. Chapter 24, verse 1. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, hmm, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his what? His puppet king <laughs> for three years. He puts him in there and he says, this is what you're going to do. You're going to work for me and you better don't rebel. And now this is what's going to happen. But then Jehoiakim turned and rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 2, and the Lord sent, and now check this out. And the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of the people of Amnon. He sent them against Judah to destroy it. Wait a minute. Hey, 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 hey. what's going on here? Didn't we, for the longest, we believed that it was the Chaldeans who destroyed the city and the temple? Under whose direction and whose orders? Who determined judgment upon Judah? So, and I know that I've said it so many times, and for that I ask you to forgive me, because I say, yeah, the Babylon, the Babylonians, they will come and they will destroy. It was the Lord's doing this whole time. Nebuchadnezzar is just the instrument. Which brings me back to this understanding of God's sovereignty. That no matter what and no matter who and no matter what's going on in the world, please take comfort in this. And things are going to continue to get ugly and uglier and worse and worse and worse. Don't lose, don't, don't lose hope in, in what you see around you. The, 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 the darker the moment, the uglier the situation, the most painful things, in it, whatever, for that, God has already prepared you. And if you're here, it's because you, you're an instrument that God wants to use so that the world around you see what God is able to do with one man, one woman who says, yes, Lord, I don't care of the madness and the craziness and everything that is going. I hear a lot of Christians, they are freaking out. They are, they are anxious. They are in, 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 in so much stress because, because uh, cryptocurrency and because the mark of the beast, because Amazon has a store that, that you, don't, you don't have to use cash and there's no cash and you got to do this and you take all your money out of the bank and relax. Relax. Have a cup of coffee. Enjoy. Yeah. Three better. Enjoy your morning. I don't, I'm not saying like forget it. No. Relax. God is the one who is in control of everything. And he rules in the affairs of men. And so this is what's going to happen here. 605. And then he says, and the Lord said against him, uh, reading bands of Chaldeans. Now verse 3. Surely at the commandment of the Lord this came upon Judah. To remove them from his side because of the sins of Manasseh. What are the sins of Manasseh? Well, to your left, chapter 21, 2 Kings. You there? Amen. I want to give you all of these things because 
they're going to make the, 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 the book of Ezekiel so much easier to read. What, are the, what, what were the abominations of Manasseh here? The sins of Manasseh. Well, chapter 21. Manasseh was 12 years old, and when he became king, and he reigned 50 years in Jerusalem, his mother's name was Hebzeba. No wonder the kid had problems. And, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord has cast out before the children of Israel. What did he do? Well, he rebuilt the high places with Hezekiah, his father, which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He raised up altars to Baal ah, and made a wooden image as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Mm. He also built altars on the house of the Lord, of which the Lord has said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he built altars for the host of heaven and in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his sons pass through the fire, practice suits, saying, use witchcraft and consult the spirits and mediums. Oh, that guy was the whole package, right? When it comes to evil. No wonder why. Now the Lord is doing this. Remember, 605. And what is 605? Well, Nebuchadnezzar comes from a very, very important battle with uh, the, the Pharaoh from the south. And what, what's going to happen is they're going to have this battle at this amazing place that is called Carchemish, and one of the most amazing military battles of all time. And Nebuchadnezzar comes victorious after that. And after he is done that, he goes south and he enters Judah and he says, I'm taking Jerusalem too. Because now he rules. And he becomes the most powerful man on the face of the earth. And this is what's, what's happening here. Now he thinks he's in control. But in reality, the Bible says that it is God who is doing all of these things. Amen? So 605, first deportation. The first time he comes in 605, he takes... A bunch of people, the smartest people, the, the handsome looking people from Israel. And, and he takes a bunch of people captive to Babylon. That is the first deportation. There are three of them. 605 is the first one. In that first group of people, in the first deportation, there's Daniel and his three friends. And they, they are going to be in that first group of people that goes to Babylon. He goes to Babylon and he has set a king, a king in, in Judah. Uh, and he says... As long as you keep it cool here, nothing's going to happen. I'm going to protect you. There's, there's, everything's going to be fine. But here's the problem. Soon as they takes the first group of people in the first deportation, there are false prophets remaining in Jerusalem. How do we know that? Ah, because Jeremiah tells us. Now, there are three prophets during this whole time of the siege of Jerusalem and the exile. Number one is Jeremiah, who is older than Ezekiel and Daniel. So Jeremiah is left behind. He's, he stayed there. And, and the first group of people make their way to Babylon, Daniel and his three friends. Daniel's ministry is going to be right at the palace, right with the government. You remember, he becomes the prime minister. He becomes actually the most powerful. They said that he was second in command. I say that Daniel was the most powerful man in Babylon. He was, he, he, God was using him. But here's Jeremiah who stays behind. And, and, and Jeremiah says, listen, you cannot stop the judgment of God. This is not Babylon. This is not Nebuchadnezzar. This is God doing this. Which reminds me, a lot of what you see in the United States of America, I know it's bad. And I know we're not okay with it. But let's not just necessarily blame the Democrats. No, seriously. Because a lot of this has to do with God removing his mighty hand of protection. And God bringing judgment. So anyway, so, so Jeremiah says, no, you, you, you better comply with this because God is using Nebuchadnezzar. He knows God is using Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment upon us. If you rebel against that, you're rebelling against God. It's not going to end up well. But there are false prophets and they said to the king, no, don't listen to him. Actually, Jer Jeremiah, just get rid of him. Remember how they treated him? I mean, all of his life, the poor man, 50 years, and nobody converted. Nobody listened. Nobody paid attention to him because he's a poor prophet that nobody cares about. And so he's telling the truth. They don't listen to him. Here are the false prophets telling the, the, the 
the king, don't, don't listen. It's all going to be okay. Soon all this is going to be over. Everything is going to be back to normal. We're, we're fine. And then before you know, the king rebels again, again uh, against Nebuchadnezzar. So the first deportation takes place 605. The second deportation takes, care, takes place 597 BC. And in that group of people, 10,000 people, including one young man by the name of Ezekiel. And that you're going to read in chapter 24, verse, verse 10. You there? Right next to chapter 24, you're going to write 597 BC, second deportation. And underneath that, in parentheses, put Ezekiel. Now, in chapter 24, verses 1 to 3, you put 605 BC, first deportation, and in parentheses, you put Daniel, yeah? Okay. Now, chapter 24, verse 10. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieged in it. Then Jehoiachin, king, uh, king of Judah, now this is another king, came against the city as his servants were besieged. Then Jehoiachin, king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, and his officers went out to the king of Babylon, and the king of Babylon in the height, and the eighth year of his reign took him prisoner. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and all the treasures of the king's house. And he cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord has said. Also he carried into captivity all Jerusalem, all the captains and all the mighty men of El, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. And he carried Jehoiachim captive to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, his officers, and the mighty of the land he carried into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. All the valiant men, 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, 1,000, all were strong and fit for war. This the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. Then the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiachim's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Okay? That's very important. So, 605, first deportation, Daniel is in the group, chapter 24. 597 BC, second deportation, Ezekiel is in that group, chapter 24, verse 10 to 16. Now, this is what is going to get interesting here, okay? <clears throat> now, notice what it says. Uh, Zedekiah, verse 18, was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutah, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jeho Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that he finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Chapter 25 now. Now it came to pass in the ninth year of, the, of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all of his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of the king of King Zedekiah. By the ninth, ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of, of the land. Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men who were fled on at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were still in camp all around against the city, and the king went by way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they pronounced judgment on him. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze feathers, and took him to Babylon. Hmm. Verse 9, what Nebuchadnezzar did, he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. So, first deportation, chapter, uh, uh, 605 B.C., Daniel is in that group, chapter 24. Second deportation, 597. <clears throat> Ezekiel is in that group, chapter 24, verses 10 to end of the chapter. Third deportation and the complete destruction of the city and the temple of Jerusalem, 586 B.C., and the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the instrument that God was using to bring judgment upon the people. Why? Well, he said it, because they have given themselves to idolatry, because it's given themselves to rebellion, and because they, they, they have 
uh, taking the things of God as nothing, and they, they despise the things of God, they, they turn away from God, and they turn to their rebellious hearts. And sad, but that's the background for the book of Ezekiel. Now let me tell you, <clears throat> just going to share quickly here some things to remember. Who is the author of the book of Ezekiel? Well, Ezekiel is. <laughs> It's amazing how you find books and books and books and books of people telling you why they think Ezekiel is not the author of the book. Well, I don't need those books. I need this one verse, and I tell you that it was Ezekiel who wrote it. So, period. That, that solves the whole problem. The author is this man who was to be a priest, and the book is going to tell us that. He is a priest, and he is going to be used by God as a prophet which is a very interesting thing because <clears throat> priest and prophet, it's a very interesting thing for serving the Lord, particularly during those conditions. I, again, I said he has a contemporary of both Jeremiah and Daniel. <clears throat> what is the purpose for writing? Ezekiel ministers to his generation, and basically what he wants to do is he wants to tell them, listen. If you're going to listen to someone, if you want to hear the truth about this, why judgment is upon us, you better listen to God. He says, it is because of the false prophets that we are in the condition that we are. It is because we departed from the word of God. We, 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 we turn our backs against the truth of God. And then later on, he's going to say, but although there will be judgment and it will be ugly, he says, there is hope. Because God is still going to fulfill his promises and, and God is faithful. Ezekiel is very interesting because the name of Ezekiel means the strength of God, or it can also mean God strengthens. Now here, I'm going to give you a few names here, a couple of names that are going to give you an understanding of what the book is all about. So Ezekiel means the strength of God or God strengthens. Ezekiel says here is the priest. It doesn't say he is a priest. And you're going to see that in the first uh, chapter. It says Ezekiel the priest. Why is that? Well, because he's not just any priest. But here's something. The priest, he's the son of Buzi. Buzi means despise, contempt, or it means the shame. It's very interesting. Put those two names together. What is that telling you? Ezekiel is the son of a man who means, uh, whose name means the shame. But what's the name of Ezekiel? What, what does the, na the name Ezekiel mean? God strengthens. So put those, th 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 those two things together. He's the son of a man whose name means the shame, but he, his name means God strengthens. So what do you do with those two things? This is what you do. In rabbinical tradition, this is what they tell you about Ezekiel. Ezekiel is the son of a man who allowed themselves to be shamed for the sake of God's honor and glory, knowing <laughs> that God is their strength. And man, this man Ezekiel is going to put himself to so much shame that you have no idea. That you have no idea. To begin with, God is going to tell him 430 days. I might be wrong on that, but 430 days you're going to be 390 days, I think he says, you're going to be, you're going to throw yourself on the ground and you're going to be on your side 390 days. And you're not going to move from that. And then the rest of these 430 days, you're going to be on the other side. And all the while, when you're there, you're going to be baking your bread. I know you read the book. You're going to be baking your bread in human waste. Until the seeker says, no, remember, he's a priest. He says, no, I never touch anything that is wicked. And no. And the Lord says, okay. And I'm just paraphrasing. The Lord's going to say, oh, okay, I'll give you a break. Find cattle and that dung you're going to use to bake your bread. The first chapters of Ezekiel, what you're going to see is the Lord's going to tell him, now shave your head. And your beard, and you're gonna do something with that hair, with that hair. And then he says, and this is what you're gonna do. Um, he gives him things to do that are so embarrassing. But by the time you get to chapter 24, 
the Lord is telling Ezekiel, this is what you're going to do. He says, these people, they don't listen to me. They don't, you know, they don't care. They don't. He says, but one thing they cannot do. If they shut their ears, they cannot shut their eyes. So they're going to have to see you acting my messages to these people. And by the way, he says, they are not going to pay attention to you anyway. So you're going to have to just do it and you're going to do it. In ch chapter 24, he says, Ezekiel, this is what I want you to do. The love of your life, your wife, he's married. Uh, she's going to die. By the end of the day, she's going to be dead. And this is what I want you to do. I don't want you to be mourning for her. I don't want you to do this weeping. And I don't want you to go in public uh, uh, giving the smallest hint that you are in pain for the death of your loved one. <laughs> And he says, because I want to tell these people, that's how they are. And so, Ezekiel is the son of a man who allowed himself to be ashamed for the sake of God's honor and glory, knowing that God is his strength. Uh, this is what I just gave you, uh, the years that I gave you. Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and all of those things, Nebuchadnezzar defeats, <clears throat> and, and all of these dates that I just gave you. So, 592, <clears throat> five years after Ezekiel makes his way to this place, I think I'm going to show you a map right now. So he's in the second group, in the second group of the deportation. He is there with 10,000 other people, but they don't go all the way to Babylon, to the city, actually. They are going to end up by a irrigation canal that is nearby, and they're going to settle there. They're going to have this, the, the, the name of the place is Tel Abib. Not Tel Aviv, but Tel Abib. And they're going to be there. They're going to settle there. And Ezekiel is there. Five years after he gets there, the Lord is going to call him to be, instead of a priest, he's going, going to call him to be a prophet. By that time, Ezekiel, who was 25 years when he left, now is 30 years old. And he is going to see the vision of God's glory, even in that place, which is an amazing thing why the book begins with that. That's the uh, little map. I don't know if you can see it from Judah, and then you're going to make their way out to the canal. It's called a river, but it's not really a river. It's, it's an irrigation canal, and it goes all around, and it, and it dumps all this water to the Persian Gulf all, over there. And that, the place is actually called Kevar, and there's something important that I wanted to share with you when it comes to the people that are there in this they, the Bible calls it a river, River Kevar. And there they are. They, they settle in that place. There's Ezekiel with them. This is what Psalm 137 says. They just listen to this. You don't have to turn there. You're going to be familiar with this. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yeah, we wept. When we remember Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there are those who carried us away captive, ask us of a song. And those who plunder us requested me, saying, Sing as one of the songs of Zion. You remember that song? And they, they're saying, How should we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. And if I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. And if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the, son, the, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Such an amazing, powerful prophecy of what was going to take place. And I'm sure once they get there, once they are there by the Kevar River, and these people come and they are mocking them. Hey, why don't you pull out your instruments and sing us a song about Zion, huh? <laughs> I'm sure they remember these things. Again, <clears throat> why is all of this happening? Now, we're going to jump actually to the book of Ezekiel in the next two hours that we have. And we're going to do three chapters. The last uh, here I want you to see, uh, just remember the names of these kings because these, these, these are going to be important. Josiah, and then after Josiah, and there are the years that they, they, they will be uh, the king, actually. This is the southern kingdom, the kings of Judah. Then after Josiah, Jehoahaz is going to come. 
Then Jehoiakim, you remember him, we read something about him. Then after Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, the son, and then the last one who is very tragic about him, Zedekiah. And he's going to be taken prisoner to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. So these kings are going to be important to remember the names because, because this is what we're going to see. Now, with the book, we're going to just take it. And this is what, if you put a, together an outline, I mean, it, it's like four pages long because there's so many chapters. But in, in just, in just a, a compacted version, this is what we are going, how we're going to read the book and how we're going to go through it. The first part of the book, which is, I, I want to remind you, read chapters 1 to chapter 3 for next week, because that's how we're going to do. And then right after that, we're going to start with chapter 3, read maybe two, three chapters at a time, and then you're going to get the context. But the first part of the book is Ezekiel's call to prophecy, and that we're going to pretty much spend the rest of our time here in just reading that portion of here, because you're going to see how clearly it falls into place. And then the, the next part of that is God's judgment on the surrounding nation. First, Ezekiel is going to tell the people, he says, he's going to say, listen, judgment is coming. It's inevitable. No matter what you do, whether you believe it or not, it is coming. Now, it's, it's interesting that he is now in exile, and he's telling the people in exile, he says, do not believe the false prophets that are saying that everything is going to be okay. God is going to bring judgment. And when it actually happens, and Ezekiel was there, and Ezekiel have said these things before, Things are getting now uh, very painful for the people there because they were hoping that things were going to be okay when in reality God's judgment was upon them. So Ezekiel called to prophecy, the first part of the book, second half of the book or second part of the book, the judgment of God upon Jerusalem. Then God is going to judge the surrounding nations because like we just read in, in Psalm 137, they are mocking, they are laughing, they're saying, ha ha, where's your God now, huh? And they are doing all these things, and God is going to say, hey, listen, if I'm judging my own people, don't you think I'm going to judge you too? So judgment is coming for you too. But then the last part of the book, we're going to see God's restoration of the Jews. And we're going to see that from chapter 33 to 48. And we're going to divide that in three chunks. The Valley of the Dry Bones, chapters 36 and 37. Gog and Magog, chapter 38 and 39. And then the last part of that, that will be the millennial. And there we're going to get to see the temple that is going to be in those days. <clears throat> and so all of that points to the millennial. And we're going to see that. Keep this in mind. Chapters 1 to 24 were given before the siege of Jerusalem. Chapters 25 to 32 were given during the siege. And chapters 33 to 48 were given after the siege. Now, after the Jerusalem is destroyed, there is no temple. Then the people are saying, like, what's next? And here comes Ezekiel, and he says, he's not going to say that, but he's going to say, I told you so. <laughs> but he's going to say, but God is a God of mercy and grace. And he will restore us. And it's actually going to be awesome. It's going to be glorious. Because when he is done with us and when we understand these things, he says, it's going to be amazing. Which is what he wanted to do from the beginning. But the hardness of our hearts kept us away from receiving his promises. We're going to learn in the book of Ezekiel a few, few lessons here that we're going to learn throughout the book. We're going to see how God delights to use human resources. Human messengers. God delights to prepare men and women and then to put them there. But here's the thing. Sometimes we don't take into consideration that we say, God, I want to serve you. I want, I want to do these things. And when the actual call comes to serve him, it might be in the most unpleasant situation and under the most difficult circumstances. Nonetheless, it is God who is using you. It might be just being in the hospital. It might be just giving a testimony when you are under a condition. It might be preaching the gospel. It might be teaching a Bible study. It might be cleaning windows. It might be uh, running the vacuum here. It, whatever it is, it is for his honor and for his glory. The point is here, are you willing to allow yourself to be shamed for his name, for his glory, knowing that he is your strength? That's, that part we, we're not okay with for the most part. I know you are because you're wonderful people. But, but I like to think that serving God is going to be joyful. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. It's going to be this. Not so. Not all the time. Sometimes people is going, I mean, God is going to allow people to go through things like, like for example, Tony. 
And, and you know, Tony, he's in the hospital and he's like, ah, oh, a lot of pain. And anybody that comes in and says, but let me tell you, man, my hope and my faith is in Christ Jesus. And he starts preaching the sermon. But, but, but are you willing to put yourself through shame for the honor and glory of God, knowing that no matter what, he is your strength? Second, we're going to see that even in defeat and despair, God's people need to affirm God's sovereignty. That it doesn't matter. Just like Ezekiel says, hey, 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 hey. Cheer up. This is not the end of everything. We are here, but check this out. God is with us. We're here, and it's not Babylon. The whole world, the whole planet is his. So whatever you go, you are in private property because it belongs to your father. And so you have to, you have to you know, remember that. Three, we're going to learn that God word, God's word never fails. He is faithful. Four, we're going to, Remember that God is present and he can be worshipped anywhere, even in the land of whatever. Fifth, we're going to learn that in order for us to understand, we need to get to know God. And the only way to know God is in, in his word. If we want to walk with God, we better, we, we, we better start getting to know God. Getting to know God, it, it, it's the beginning of getting to walk with God. And getting to know God and getting to walk with God is, is the amazing life of loving God above all things. Because we expect to spend eternity with him. I might as well get to know him now. And he makes himself uh, available and he wants to be known. And, 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 and six, in this thing that we are going to learn, we're going to learn that God's kingdom will come. And we've been praying for many years. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So now, turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. <clears throat> You're going to notice a lot of difficult things here, but hang in there. There is light in this thing. I was reminded uh, <clears throat> the other day that says, God, God's word enlightens, enlightens me and God's hand enables me. I, I, I was reminded of that. It is by the word of God that light turns on in the right path, in the right direction. It is the word of God that gives me the light unto my feet and a lamp unto my feet. But it is the hand of God that actually enables me to do and to go in that direction. One thing you will notice in the book of Ezekiel, and this I want to give you, this phrase, you shall know that I am the Lord. You shall know that I am the Lord. is going to be repeated 33 times in the book of Ezekiel. Now, there's another phrase that is similar to that, and it's just this, know that I am the Lord. In the Bible, that phrase is repeated 96 times. In the Old Testament, 93 times. In the book of Ezekiel, 64 times. So how about that, huh? The God keeps telling you over and over and over, what's the matter? Well, we are in this difficulty. We are going through this thing. What are the Listen, I want you to know that I am the Lord. I want you to know that I am the Lord. But my pain, I still want you to know that I am the Lord. But I don't understand. But I do, because I want you to know that I am the Lord. And we're going to be reading that phrase over and over and over. So we might as well get used to it. Chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th. In the 30th year, in the fourth month of the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. <clears throat> now immediately when you, when you hear that, the heavens were open, and you see visions of God, do not, do not torture yourself trying to understand what you see. You cannot in human language express heavenly scenario. But this is a glimpse of heaven, and this is something that God is allowing us to see, to have a visual. In this case, through Ezekiel, just so that you understand that heaven, way above us, is the place where God rules. But he makes himself available to us, even here on earth. Because we are his, and because he will never leave us, but can never forsake us. So the vision that we might have of heaven... And in the moment that we start saying, like, I don't understand. I don't get it. What is it that you don't understand? I don't understand the vision. I don't understand the symbolic symbolism of this. I don't do you understand the person of God? Because what I want you to see, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm giving you the warning ahead of time, because you're going to start hearing these things, and I'm, I'm going to butcher a lot of these words, because, I mean, this is a lot. I want you to understand 
But what you're about to see is the vision of God's throne. And that right on, that, on top of that, there is God's glory, meaning his person. <laughs> and that's all you need to remember. Don't torture yourself with the wills and the faces. And it, don't do that. Just know that sitting on that throne is the God of the universe. And by the way, he is your Abba. He is your daddy. Amen? Amen? On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's, Jehoiachim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of Chaldeans by the river Kevar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Again, like I said, the word of the Lord gives you light, enlightens you, the hand of the Lord enables you. And now he's ready. He's got the word of God, and he has the hand of God upon him. Then I look and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire, engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' <laughs> feet. Their sparkle like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings, and on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. And each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces, their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another and took over their bodies. And each one went straight forward. They went wherever the spirit wanted to go and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. Now as I look at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature, which is four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their working Workings was like the color of barrel, and uh, all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was as it were wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they moved, they went forward. Any one of the four directions, they did not turn aside when they went. As for the rims, they were so high, they were awesome. And the rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels li were lifted up. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went, because there were spirit there where the spirit went, and the wheels were lifted together with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, the, the, these stood, and when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. The likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creature was like the color of an awesome crystal that stretched out over their heads. And under the firmament, there were wings spread out straight, one or another. Each one had two which covered one side, and each one had two which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Whenever they stood, they let down their wings. And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man's hive above it. Also from the appearance of his weight and upward I saw, as it were the color of amber, with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his weight and downward I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Like the presence of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one speaking. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. Then the Spirit entered, the, entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet. And I heard him who spoke to me. 
And he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. For they are impudent and stubborn children, and I'm sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of the words of this may by their looks, though they are rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I look, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat the, the scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly. And fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of unfamiliar speech and of a hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely... I have sent you to them. They will have listened to you. But the house of Israel will not listen to you. Because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made your faces strong against their faces. And your foreheads strong against their foreheads. Like Adam and stone, harder than flint, I have made you your forehead. Do not be afraid of them. Nor be dismayed at their looks though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears. And go to the captives, to the children of your people, and speak to them and tell them, Thus is the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they refuse. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice, Blessed is the glory of the Lord from his place. I also heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another, and the noise of the wheels beside them, and great thunderous noise. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went, I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Hmm. Then I came to the captives of, the, of at Tel Aviv, who dwell by the river Kabar, and I sat where they sat, and remained there astonished among them seven days. Oof. <clears throat> I came to pass at the end of the seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. I'm going to have to stop there. That's actually the second half, and I don't want to go past that. So what do we get? Can you just put yourself a little bit in the shoes of Ezekiel? You're waiting, the day is coming when you're going to be ordained, if you will, to be a priest. You've been learning all of these years. You've been preparing yourself. You've been going in and out at the temple. At age 17, they had the, they had the, 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 the ability to go in the temple and to be with the other priest. And they have studied all these utensils and they have studied all the ceremonies. They, 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 they just know everything that takes place in the temple as they are being prepared to be priests. And then suddenly one day he says, nope, 
age 25, five years before you're actually ordained, and, and then you are moved, and you're in another country, you're under another culture, you're in a different place, and there you are. But the beautiful encouragement here from Ezekiel, and, and I pray that I will always have the same heart, that no matter where the Lord uh, wishes to send me or, or, or delights in, in, in doing with my life, that when I get there, I will be ready and that my ears will be open and that my heart will be willing to receive. So when he speaks to me, he says, hear with your ears and believe and receive in your heart and do not be rebellious, that I will have that. And I know that when he takes his place and he, he's going to send you somewhere, you're going to be astonished of how in the world God being so good, so faithful, so generous, so kind, why is it that people are so rebellious? But I'm willing, and I know you're willing, as long as you know that the word of God <laughs> enlightens you and that the hand of the Lord enables you. Now, go home and pray. Make that your prayer until next week. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want your word to enlighten me. Whatever it is that you're going through right now, Brothers and sisters, whatever it is, there might be things like this for us in the future, in the near future. If we continue in this direction, you might be an Ezekiel in a place where God, hey, it doesn't have to be a foreign nation. You might be an Ezekiel to your family. And you're going to be astonished how some of our family members are so rebellious and are so against God. And we're going to be there as long as the word of God enlightens us and the hand of God enables us. We will be ready. Amen. Because faithful is he who is with us. And it doesn't matter whether it's here or in China. If I happen to be in the middle, in the midst of the most wicked nation, my God is able to bring his glory and shine his glory to remind me, hey, don't lose track of things. Here is the God of the universe watching over you. And he's going to put the spirit in you. And then he's going to send you. And he's going to say, now move and do these things for the honor and glory of your God. Father, you are so good to us. Oh, Lord. Mm. We're really, really, really <laughs> getting to the introduction of this amazing book. And we already see that is going to be loaded with so much to learn about you. God, you're amazing. We have the privilege of looking back to the life of Ezekiel, to Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. They had to look forward to things that they didn't know, to a wicked nation with a wicked ruler, with, with, with pagan customs and cultures and things and idolatry and immorality and all of that. And yet, you used Daniel to be the most powerful man in Babylon. You used Jeremiah, even when he was thrown in the well. <laughs> you used him to rebuke the king. You used Ezekiel to tell us about things that no other man got the privilege of seeing or hearing from you. Ezekiel, and only Ezekiel can tell us, even at this stage of history, that there was going to be a day when Messiah was going to come and he was going to rule for a thousand years. And Ezekiel got to see the new temple. What a blessing. Father, I pray that you will send us home rejoicing. And if there is anything that we get from tonight, God, it is my desire that your word will enlighten me and that your hand will enable me for whatever it is to be a good husband, to be a good dad, to be a good brother, to serve you and to serve you well. May your spirit fill me and may your will take me to the place that you have prepared that even in my shame, I will give you honor and glory for that is the desire of our hearts. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.